Okay, so so good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to to have you here at the Institute uh, for Philosophy and Social Theory, uh, University of Belgrade. Uh, we gathered here to host um, our today's uh, speaker, Dimitris Christopoulos, who is a Greek uh, activist and academician, a professor at the Pantheon University in Athens. Um, he is in Belgrade, as uh, many other people who are sitting here in the, in the audience, within the um, uh, project Erasmus Plus uh, that, is, um, uh, that is taking place now in Belgrade, but is developed uh, by five universities, uh, Faculty of Media and Communications in Gidunum University in Belgrade, and four other universities, Pantheon from Athens, University in, in Napoli, University in Verona and von University from Skopje. The topic of today's talk um, will be the issue that is uh, not so often discussed in Serbia. Uh, that is the issue of the relationship between um, Macedonia, or now as it, as it is called officially North Macedonia, and Greece. This dispute that has been uh, lasting for at least the last three decades um, actively, if not even longer, is um, the topic of the book that uh, Dimitris co-authored um, that is called 10 plus 1 questions and answers on Macedonian question. Um, he will be uh, having a uh, short introduction where he will cover the main argument um, of this book that is developed through 10 plus 1 questions and answers about the Greek Macedonian issue from the perspective of Greece. After that, I will pose um, one or two additional questions to Dimitris, and um, after that, the floor will be yours. So Dimitris, once again, thank you for uh, coming here, and um, the floor is yours. I thank you very much for uh, the invitation. It's always a pleasure to be here. Actually, it's the second time that I find myself uh, lecturing in this institute. The first one goes back to 2011, so it's already 10 years ago. And uh, it's always a pleasure to see you all here within the framework of the, the Geo-Balkan uh, project, which uh, unites us today here. Um, the book you are mentioning is uh, free online in English, so you can have uh, access to that. I mean, if you Google Christopoulos 10 plus 1 questions and answers on the Macedonian, you will uh, get it. Um, I need the microphone. Okay. So, um, th this book was written in 2018. In, um, it was published in March 2018 three months before the PRESPA agreement was signed uh, between the two countries and in a way was written in order to provide arguments in favor of the settlement of the Greek Macedonian dispute about the name to a wider Greek public. That was needed at the time. So the, the, the raison d'etre, the reason why we, we did this book, which is a simple handbook, it's not a big uh, historian uh, book of political history, but it's a simple uh, book and a short one, as you might see, um, was that uh, we really needed to, to give uh, simple arguments in favor of uh, settling the dispute, arguments would, that would uh, have uh, demystified the Greek uh, uh, way of putting the issue during the last uh, 30 years. So the, the objective, the explicit objective of the book was to deconstruct major Greek arguments regarding the name dispute, which is one of the major uh, identity disputes in the Balkans of the post-Cold War period. Um, as, I, as you all know, of course, that is a dispute that started with the dissolution of Yugoslavia and the independence of the Republic of Macedonia at the time, so it's already 30 years. And uh, during these 30 years, it's actually it's a big part of my life, of my 
of my life being uh, a citizen. So at the, now I'm 52. At the time I was 21 to 22. I, was, I graduated. I was. I, I had just graduated law school in Greece, and I was on my way to do my master's uh, uh, studies in France, uh, and then it started. So actually, my generation in Greece, we, we grew up with this uh, issue. It's a part of what uh, we became and what uh, we are. And all, all along these 30 years, uh, when I say my generation, I include, of course, Lambros Balciotis, who is with us, and he's a Greek historian uh, associate professor at Pantheon University with a great expertise on the Macedonian issue from the historical perspective. So during this period, uh, a big part of our uh, political uh, uh, profile, a big part of the way we think of politics has been shaped via our opposition to the Greek um, uh, official stand regarding the, the name of our neighboring country. Our argument was rather simple that we do not have any moral grounds to claim that we can baptize any anyone. So as simple as that. The, 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 the difficulty here, and uh, this is where the difficulty of understanding starts. Now, th th this uh, debate will not be a debate about uh, trying to, to, to protest against the, the, the Greek side. It's trying to, to make you understand what happened in Greece over the last 30 years. Uh, over these last 30 years, everywhere uh, I've been going and everywhere Lambros and every Greek has been going in order to, to, to discuss about this issue or even to discuss broader issues of uh, geopolitics, of political uh, philosophy and so on. Our interlocutors will uh, never understand uh, why Greece has reacted this way. What was the reason behind the Greek delusion? I could also say delusional disorder in a way. Um, regarding the name of uh, of, uh, of Macedonia, so obviously Greece is not crazy. No state is completely crazy. Of course, a portion of pathology exists in every national ideology, but uh, you cannot explain the political actions of uh, collective subjects such as people or states or nations by invoking a kind of schizophrenia. This is not enough. Saying that again, an element of pathos, an element of uh, uncontrollable sentiment is always included into politics. So I don't think here we will say that uh, politics is also always a matter of a rational choice and so on and so on. So we are against this line, but also we could not uh, fall in the trap uh, to believe that uh, politics is only a matter of passion and, uh, and so on. So there is a reason. And of course there is a reason. So all these year we have been, years we have been discussing with friends what, what lies behind this Greek stubborn persistence not to, to have a, a country uh, next to us which will carry the name of Macedonia. And I think that if I may summarize the reason here is the following. Uh, the, the Greek nation is one of the oldest nations in the Balkans. When I say oldest nation in the Balkans, forget the antiquity. We speak about the modern Balkans, the post-Ottoman Balkans. We speak about the Greek Revolution. We celebrate this year 200 years of the Greek Revolution. And uh, the first Greek constitutions that have been drafted during the revolution uh, uh, in their first article uh, mention that uh, the Greek citizen is the Christian inhabitant of the state. So we have an interconnection between uh, the member of the uh, of the Rum Millet, the member of the of the Orthodox Church subordinated to the Patriarch of uh, Constantinople, with the Greek citizen. So whoever is a, 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 a Greek Orthodox is Greek, and this is deeply rooted inside the Greek political history. The complete identification of the Greek, of the member of the Greek Orthodox Yenos, the, 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 the subordinated community to the Patriarch of, Istanbul, of uh, Constantinople with the member of the nation to be formed. If we consider that this is a line, this is the normative line, the prescription of who is the Greek citizen all along these two centuries, the Macedonian issue comes as a pain in the ass for this uh, identification. Because throughout the Greek history, you have minorities like the Jewish minority or like the Muslim minority or Turks who obviously 
are minorities and they do not belong to the Greek genos and the nation because they're not Christians. But uh, you apparently seem to have a, a, a community that um, is Christian, recognizes the supremacy of the Patriarch of uh, Constantinople, does not join the Bulgarian National Church in 1871, and wants to remain under the Patriarch, but still does not speak Greek, speaks a language which is much closer to Bulgarian at the time. We call it Bulgarian. Some at the beginning or at the end of the 19th century, the, the term Macedonian is at place. So there is an issue of what is this community? So this community gets its profile, obtains its profile by the position, by the geographical position, which is Macedonian. So we are not Bulgarians because we do not follow the Bulgarian church. We are not Greeks because we do not speak Greek. And uh, after all, uh, we do not want the Greeks to interfere so much in our internal affairs. What we are, we are Macedonians. I simplify here because a considerable part, considerable part of the of this community has become Bulgarian during this period in the eastern part of what we call Greek Macedonia. And a big part of this community has also become, has also Hellenized itself during the years. So we have a considerable part of ethnic Macedonians in a way who see themselves as absolutely Greeks over the last three or four centuries. So the basis then of understanding what is this Macedonian community is the fact that we have a bipolarity here, a bipolarity, which is on the one hand non-Greek in terms of language, non-Bulgarian in terms of religion, and tries to find its own identity in the Balkans at the end of the 19th century, at the time of the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire. For the Greek side, this community is unthinkable, is inconceivable, because the, the main problem that the Greek nationalist movement has is the Bulgarians. Because they are the ones who oppose the Greeks. So the, the main issue during the two Balkans war, the first Balkan war is everybody against the, the, the Ottomans. Second Balkan war, everybody against the, the, the Bulgarians. And the traditional enemy of the Greek side in this story, in the Macedonian story, is not this small community which tries to, to find its identity through the years, but it is Bulgaria. Bulgaria claims Greek territory. Bulgaria wants to have an access to the AGNC and so on. So for one century, from 1870 to 1970, the exclusive enemy of Greek nationalism is Bulgaria. Until 1970, I have to tell you that Bulgaria was even much more of an enemy than Turkey was for us. What is the issue with Macedonia? The issue is that it is inconceivable for the Greek nation state vocabulary to have an identity Macedonian which cannot be Greek. And therefore, due to the fact that this is inconceivable for the Jacobin Greek vocabulary, what I mean by Jacobin Greek vocabulary, I mean a classic French pattern which says one state, one nation, and one language. Next to this pattern, we have our own post-Ottoman, which is one religion also. So next to this post-Ottoman France, which is Greece, and Turkey is a post-Ottoman France in its way, we cannot think of a Macedonian identity which is antagonistic to the Greek one. And there lies the problem. For years, the Greek state has been doing what it takes in order to neutralize this identity. And the big part of this political operation was the Greek civil war in the 40s. The last part of which was to a big extent a war against the Slav Macedonian communist, okay, in the mountains of North Greece. When this ends, the Greek state starts a strategy of implements, a strategy of total repression against all minorities in the 50s. And within this policy of total repression, one exception for the Turkish minority in Western Thrace, which was recognized according to an international treaty, all the rest is completely invisible, nothing, no languages, no religions, nothing, nothing. Still in Greece, the line is that there is one minority and that's it. 
this total repression line becomes extremely repressive when it comes to any kind of perception that leads to a, a, a Macedonian identity. Why? First, because this Macedonian identity is completely inconceivable in terms, in semantic terms, for the Greek national vocabulary. Second, because this minority, during the 40s, took the arms against the Greek state. And the last part of the Greek civil war was, to a considerable extent, a war which is not a civil Greek war, but was a war against Slav Macedonian communists and the Greek national army. For all these reasons, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, the line is complete repression. We don't talk nothing. We do not recognize that there is any. This is a non-issue, as we say. And uh, uh, since we're here, allow me to recall a famous uh, distinction made by uh, uh, American political uh, scientists between issues and non-issues. The issues are the issues that we decide upon and we can speak on. The non-issues is are the issues that there is such political violence, violence on that we do not even accept to discuss. The non-issues are the most important issues that unify and divide communities. The issues that we do not even dare to address. So that is par excellence the Macedonian issue. Relations between Athens and Belgrade during the Cold War very, very good. One problem, Macedonian problem, that both governments, because they wanted to continue their good bilateral relations, decided to not to touch. When 1991, we have the Declaration of Independence in former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Republic of Macedonia, then the whole perception, the whole myth, the whole idea that there is not an issue fades. Why? Because not only there is an issue, but next to us there is a country <laughs> that carries the name of the non-issue. So the whole argument, a bloody argument, an argument based on blood, an argument based on war, an argument that took lives, an argument that served the Greek raison d'etat for one century, that we need to clean the territory, we need to create one state, one nation, one language, etc., etc., fades out of the blue the day after the independence of your country. And there starts the mania. What we are doing with this non-issue, that now is not anymore a non-issue, but it's the name of a country. And the whole story collapses. So the non-issue becomes an issue, we still do not accept that it is an issue. Therefore, for 30 years, until 2018, the, the, the official proclamation of the Macedonian issue was that it is a non-issue. So actually, Greece followed a policy against the proclamation of independence of Macedonia with the name Macedonia because of the fact that you had this background, which in a way dictated to the Greek raison d'etat, to the Greek authorities, these kind of policies. I say that, and I spent five minutes on that, because I think it's very important to understand and something that was very difficult for us to, to shape it in this way during these difficult years, to, to explain what lies behind this irrational behavior. So, yes, irrational, yes, sentimental, Yes, you can name it what you want, but there is a historical background which frames it and explains to a certain extent what happened, what happened. Uh, in the 90s, Greece, for the first time, sees itself as an important capitalist metropolis of the Balkans due to the fact that it's the first time that it's obvious that the correlation of power between Greece and the neighbors, it's for the first time pro-Greek. Okay. Migration from Balkan states to Greece, etc., etc., amplify the feeling of a Greek supremacy. Greek nationalism, which for years has been in a way, had stayed in the shadow due to the fact that it became synonymous to the post civil war regimes, it became synonymous, abused by the Greek dictatorship, 
for the first time, the Greek nationalism starts to feel comfortable enough to, to stand up, forgetting the guilt of the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. And the Macedonian issue, the name issue, became par excellence the perfect object for the, how should I say, the purification for, the, for baptizing the Greek nationalism as a common issue for all Greeks, left and right. Because until then, Greek nationalism belonged to the right or to the extreme right. It's only in the 80s with the socialist government, with PASOK, and particularly the 90s with the Macedonian issue, that nationalism became, nationhood became an issue for all. And the issue of the, the Macedonian dispute was par excellence the perfect instrument for that. It allowed to bring the left again into the mainstream, forget the left guilt for the, of the civil war, because the left needed a way to clean the guilt of the, of the civil war. The right also wants to clean the guilt of classic uh, extreme right uh, nationalism, collaborationalism, etc., etc., etc. So there is a perfect enemy, which fits exactly into the agenda of what we were calling at the time the strong Greece, Ishiri Elada, the strong Greece, which meant for the first time a country that had the guts to impose to someone something which was for the Greeks unconceivable in the 70s. So this is how the system functioned, and this is how we arrived where we did we arrive. We were discussing with Lambros before we came here, and I finish. Um, how and to what extent the Greek political elites managed to, to, lead, to let, managed to cultivate such an issue, and to what extent the political elites of my country are responsible for this degeneration of political culture in Greece. We do not have an answer. I think that we ought to Syriza the fact that uh, this dissolutional order came to an end because Syriza was not a party that belonged to the Greek political elites, was not a classic establishment party. And that gave Syriza the political courage in order to do something which had a political cost in the Greek traditional way to put it. Syriza, after the compromise of summer 2015, wanted to find a way to prove that after all, we are left, and we want to prove to our left audience that we do something which is well-deserved for us. So I think this is what might explain, to a certain extent, the courage shown by Tsipras and his government to find a solution and a compromise to the, to the name dispute uh, with uh, North Macedonia. I think this is how where we stand where we that, that is how we came where we are today. Three months after the after the, we finished the book, PRESPA agreement was signed. And uh, I will read to you what um, I think it's the, the big achievement of PRESPA. Uh, I think I mean international law is the law of compromise, is the law of trying to build together uh, two different incompatible political wills. So I think we can find that in the first paragraph of Article 7 of the PRESPA agreement, which reads as follows. The parties acknowledge that their respective, that their respective understanding of the terms Macedonia and Macedonian refers to a different historical context and cultural heritage. I think this paragraph, this sentence, will be read in the future as a masterpiece of international law, of trying to find solutions to disputes. This is the, I think, the, 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 the hard core of what a compromise means. So we do not try to find a, a common understanding of what is Macedonia. Forget it. For you, Macedonia is a nation. For us, it's antiquity, blah, blah, whatever. But we accept and we acknowledge the fact that this term can carry different connotations according to the traditions of the two countries. And I think for me, this, as I said, is a masterpiece of international law and will be read as such in the future. So to finish, generally, all of us in Belgrade, in Skopje, in Athens, to a lesser extent, in Verona and Napoli, we are used in sad and bad news from our history. Presp agreement has been a good exception in this story of our uh, of our lives. So that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dimitris. Um, before I give the floor to the audience, I was just curious about one specific thing. You touched upon the role of the left, uh, both um, during the civil war and afterwards. You said that especially PASOK, um, in a way, accepted this issue as being non-issue in the 1980s. Um, and afterwards, um, an actor such as Syriza had to show up, so the, the actor outside the political mainstream in order to um, tackle this issue in a way um, it, it did. My first um, additional question is, do you think that Syriza paid uh, the price of this agreement and um, how important uh, was this agreement for what uh, came next uh, on the elections and uh, decrease in support of Syriza? This is the question number one. And the question number two, uh, how strong is still the myth of Macedonia in Greece after the PRESPA agreement was signed and whether it, it plays uh, the same or even the stronger role um, after the agreement was reached? I wrote uh, after the elections of 2019 that uh, it is not, we do not have to attribute to PRESPA agreement the, the victory of the, of the right wing and I insist on that. If you see the, the results of the Greek national elections according to the regions, Syriza did not lose that much in the north part of Greece as it did in south, which means that if you consider that, it appears that the press agreement has not been the reason why Syriza lost. There are other reasons which are relevant to this discussion, but I highly doubt, and I can prove it with numbers, that Syriza did not lose because of press. To your second point, if the issue is still an issue in Greece, everything is an issue because after all, okay, people think what they think. The pandemic that came after had consolidated, has consolidated a very underdog and very reactionary, reactionary political culture of, you know, against vaccination and all that. And this fits very well with uh, the Greek uh, Macedonian uh, underdog nationalism. So actually the same people who were protesting against the PRESPA agreement uh, two years ago are now protesting against vaccination to a certain extent. But that's life, we're used to that and uh, we go on. But uh, uh, what is for sure, and you can see that through the behavior of this government, which is absolutely predictable when it comes to the PRESPA agreement, it's obvious that they will not dare to put their fingers on that. They will not do their best in order to implement it. And they're still putting some issues and they're taking time, et cetera, et cetera. They do not go as fast as they should have been doing. But of course, no great government will dare to touch on uh, the PRESPA agreement. Thank you very much. So now we'll um, take some questions or comments from the audience. Jacques, please. How much of an issue is this to regular people in Greece? Not, I mean, ordinary people, not political elites. People in Athens, Thessaloniki, or wherever, worried about their livelihoods after 2008. Was this really such a big issue for the general population at that time? Yes. I think it was the biggest issue. Sorry, just a technical question. Do we hear the, the questions from the audience? But or the, we you, should, have, you, you have a mic. It's okay. It's okay? It's okay. Yeah. Please. Yes, I think that the, the name issue has been the biggest so-called national issue we had in Greece. It's something people talked about around the kitchen table. In 2010, 2011, Greece was under bankruptcy, and but still the major issue was that, I have to tell you. And we never considered that what happened in Greece over the last 10 years of the, so, the big Greek crisis was ever a national issue. The Greek public debt, for example, which is 203%, of our GDP is not a national issue. You can say whatever you want about that. You can say, I want to get rid of the debt. You can say, I want to pay the debt. You can say whatever. No one will, okay, you have a democracy, everybody says what they want. But this issue was not like that. That was like, a, if you said the term Macedonia, it was like blasphemy in the Middle Ages. Was, uh, was there ever strong pressure from Berlin or Brussels uh, on, on, on Athens to, uh,
I do not have an answer to your last question, which I find extremely interesting. Uh, I think that the Greek arrogance of, of the 90s was a reason that will prevent any kind of settlement. On the other hand, the trauma of the Greek crisis is not necessarily a reason to, to calm things. I mean, it can lead to two different completely um, behaviors. Brussels and Berlin were never, never vocal when it came to this issue. I think that the Germans played a role during the last period, but uh, if you compare the level of pressure that the, the Germans exercised in Skopje, it is uncomparable higher to the level of pressure that the Germans exercised in Athens. The Germans, after what happened in Greece 2010-2015, did not push very much the Greeks. The Americans, yes. The Americans, they were always in the line of trying to, to keep the, the possibility of a settlement. But still very um, cautious vis-a-vis -vis the Greek way of doing things. Mm. Do you think it was necessary we have... for a government like Syriza to come to power to, to get this done? Because historically there have been cases of right-wing governments doing the leftist thing, like things in China, things like that. Uh, I don't know the answer. That was the discussion we had with Lambert before, imagine. Mm -hmm. I think yes, and that is also because uh, I believe that to a certain extent in our current democracies and the, the, the way our political system works with this media and all this thing, it's very difficult for the political elites to make uh, difficult political decisions. So in a certain way, I think yes, we needed Syriza in Greece for that. We and Syriza needed something to show to us, to say, okay, we did it. We have a second question from Igor and then go on. No, Igor was first. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dimitris. Uh, it was very clear and I think you helped to many of us to understand this. And this comes in the context of our project on geophilosophy of the Balkans. So, uh, um, um, trying to get into the philosophy of nationalism a bit and trying to see whether the because what you describe tells us that clearly the, the passage of time does not invalidate nation as a historical construction. It is still present. It loses its political economical power that it had before in this world. But these issues of a narrative attachment identity are obviously still with us. We painfully experience this in the former Yugoslavia. And uh, uh, obviously this uh, situation with Greece, that is a member of EU, that is a prosperous country, and then it goes bonkers over the little state that just uh, happened to be on its border, was a really, a really confusing. Now, now when you explain it, it seems that this is a, that certain narratives, uh, call it philosophy or whatever, but we could say that there is a certain rational in kind of nationalistic narrative as, as well persist over time, that you cannot uh, uh, get rid of them so easily. Uh, that they are going to, to be this burden on the shoulders, as Marx would say, of future generations. Uh, now, my question would be like, OK, this is a big step forward. The taboo is broken. Someone uh, had the guts to sign the agreement and to, to, to turn the non -issue, to issue into the non-issue now. Uh, but it still, it stays, it's a, it's a bitter taste because obviously all these elements against which progressive people fight are still there. That the symbols, identity, very, very reductionist approach to history and community is present and that people are ready to fight and to kill for it. That this could get you into complete psychopathology and into, into frenziness uh, that no one can for 30 years speak about the issue. Uh, uh, that is so traumatic for uh, for the for the collective identity. Obviously, we have a lot of experience with this here as well in almost each of these communities. <coughs> what is your view? Can we go over this? Is it going to follow us? Uh, is there some, some different type of philosophy of community that we could build that will supersede the ethno-nationalist narrative, or this ethno-nationalist narrative will survive? 
uh, even in, 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 in future periods when the nation as a historical formation is losing its capacity to organize life on a certain territory? I don't know. It, it depends to what uh, the future will bring uh, to our children and to our lives. I mean, if things go well enough in, uh, in North Macedonia, I think that uh, in 20 years, some fanatics in both sides will remember that in order to, to have a raison d'etre for their political existence. So if things do not go well in Europe, if things do not go well in uh, North Macedonia, if things generally seem destabilized in Western Balkans, if uh, we start again in terms of uh, exchanging territory, blah, blah, all these uh, things that from time to time are discussed here, I think that uh, obviously there would be fertile soil in order to uh, reconstruct the narrative based on solid uh, political material ground now. So I believe I'm classic here. I mean, if there is enough material, then it, you can have enough ideology. If there is no space for that, sooner or later it will be remembered, but okay. It's better to have a bitter taste than bitter food. For 30 years we have been eating bitter food. Okay, the taste, we can live with this. <laughs> thank you very much. Gordon, please. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dimitris. Uh, wonderful presentation and uh, very, very complicated perspective because the perspective you're giving us uh, seems to us from our side of the border that uh, the question of nationalism or the Macedonian question in Greece is now diffused completely as a fog. Uh, and there, that, that it's not a question of uh, discussing or debating in the society. I'm interested in at what, at what extent this is true, because on the other side, we have a peculiar situation. In Macedonia, today is North Macedonia. Everybody has the, the press agreement. Apart, a tiny liberal community, I would say some kind of intellectual, intellectual niche market, uh, which is uh, praising it. So you have the right from a, the Romane who absolutely deplore the, the agreement, using and abusing for nationalist instrumentalization, et cetera, et cetera. But the, there is a big portion of, uh, of, of people who, the revision of the agreement, et cetera, et cetera. And then you have the left. Most of the left are maybe ashamed because we had to, we had to do this compromise, but they swallow it. We were, uh, it was a trick question, the referendum that we were going to enter start negotiations, obviously from now. So there is a kind of a retro gusto about that. But anyway, we are swallowing that. Uh, but it is a question of public debate now, during the local election, during the next national election. Uh, the leader of the, of one of the opponents said that he's going to revise, of course, he's not going to revise the agreement, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm talking, about the, the perspective you were giving to us, that was my point, was so good that if we are able to explore, to expand this niche market of tiny liberals who are for the, uh, absolutely, they praise uh, the agreement and they are hated because of that in the country, Kaczkowski, for example, uh, if, we, if we can expand your perspective to us, uh, then it could be very beneficial to the, to the wider, let's say, liberal community. Because we don't understand, for example, I was born in, uh, in 1991, I, had, I was 12, 13 years. It was inconceivable for us that if we become an independent state, that we are not going to be called uh, call ourselves Macedonia. It was out of the question. You know, me as a child, but for everybody. And when you see your perspective, it is dramatic perspective in your eyes. Because if, if I even if try to understand your perspective, uh, to walk in your shoes, then it will be easier for me to swallow the, uh, the change of the name. Because uh, still, because of the entangled histories, uh, Precisely stipulated in the Article 7, because these are entangled, entangled histories. We are still Macedonians. And you lost uh, no, no, no. the cause that actually there are some, actually some other Macedonians who are officially recognized as Macedonians, despite the fact they lost their, uh, their name. Uh, comment, and if you have a comment, and just a final, uh, was uh, about the comment on the previous uh, question. Uh, the American strategy, this is a nasty comment a little bit, the American strategy for the resolution of the uh, Greek Macedonian dispute was that actually the right wing parties in power should resolve that. 
with Gruyevsky. Part of the reason why Gruyevsky was so long in power was because he was promising lying, of course, all the time that he was for the issue. For the Americans, it was very nice. It, it seems reasonable. If right wing uh, parties uh, resolve the issue, then he used the Persians. It didn't happen. But still, it, it's, it's a good uh, agreement. Thank you. If I might comment, because the first part of your, uh, of your uh, reflection for me, it is the most crucial in this story. How can you construct a resilient political discourse which will differentiate itself from a shallow liberal idealism uh, in both sides, which is very easy to be deconstructed by the, the political opponent? So I remember, for example, during this period, some Greek liberal political elites, this kind of, uh, will, tell, will tell you, but what is the problem? There is no threat. And then came someone who knew Greek history. I said, OK, there is no threat. And what happened in 1949? How this is not a threat for Greek political unity? So what I try to do here is a little bit to go there and not to to, to construct again a shallow argument which says, okay, no peace, no threat, blah, blah. There has been an issue, obviously, in the past. There has been a minority that suffered in Greece more than any other minority. It's for the first time now that people dare to speak their language publicly. Okay. And of course, there has been a political organization of a big part of this minority which took the guns against the Greek state. So you tell me that this is no threat, someone will tell you. That has been a threat. So in a way, we need to go through this in order to avoid political humiliation. And I think this is very crucial. I don't know how you do that in Macedonia. That is extremely important. It's extremely important to, that's why I came, we, we had the, the book translated to Macedonian by the Helsinki Committee in Macedonia. So that is what we try to do. It's one thing to be naive and to say in an idealistic way, okay, people should find solution to that. That is theology. But and the second thing is to go a little bit deeper in history and try to, to do the thing, to do the work. Um, the problem here of the Greek pol of the, of the Greek polarization of the Greek polarization was the fact that the Greek side functioned by creating all this time uh, self-fulfilling prophecies. They will tell you, okay, you see, they want to. Uh, use our antiquity. So Greek side was doing that, Gruevsky was doing that. They said, okay, yeah. what, what else do you expect to hear? And particularly the first years of Gruevsky was the moment that for a lot of members of the European Union who for, for which the Greek stand was completely unbearable, it became to a certain extent, uh, yes, so okay, they're right. So that is how it functioned. So the Greek way of doing the things has cultivated and alimented this self-fulfilling prophecy that, okay, the Macedonians are abusing the Greek antiquity and so on and so on. So that is how it went. And that is why Prespa has been a good thing. Now I fully understand that there is an issue, that you cannot save it through, I don't know, I, I, the, I don't know what will be the, the Macedonian way to write the dispute, which will be the other side of what we wrote here with Karpozilos. But this is a good perspective of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, are there some, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, no, just to add a supplement to uh, tied to the idea of the uh, geophilosophy of uh, nationalisms um, and uh, thinking about uh, how this might impact upon the project we're involved in, but at the same time trying to think how it can be worlded uh, in a way which allows us to uh, draw, I'm not sure lessons is the right expression, but to, uh, 
to draw understandings from what you've discussed in, in great detail. Um, I'm thinking about, because obviously uh, this question of uh, ethno-nationalisms is not simply restricted to the specific histories of the Balkans. It's part of, a, it's part of the making of modern Europe. And as you say, there are often issues which are not seen as issues, but they are real issues and so on. Uh, and that, of course, has emerged very strongly elsewhere. I mean, think of the whole movement of the so-called Northern League in Italy, which now presents itself as a national, nationalizing nationalist, ethno-nationalist uh, party uh, against using questions of migrants and migration as a, as a building and <coughs> cementing force. Or think of um, Brexit, ethno-nationalism, being English, taking back control of our borders. I know they come out of different histories, but at the same time, I think it's important to register how they are entangled in a, in a sort of constellation which you call modern Europe, so the specific histories. And I think it's important uh, to avoid, for us, I'm not speaking from outside, but it's important to avoid uh, the continuing balkanization of particular problems, that this, uh, you know, will this be what you expect, you know, sort of thing coming out of the Balkans. And I think it's, um, there are deeper histories which invite us to rethink the very nature of uh, so-called European, Occidental modernity, state formations, and so on. Uh, and so things are happening here right on the ground, which seem to be a minor problem from London or from Washington, are actually uh, raise very significant questions in general for all, all of us. And then there's a question also about nationalisms, because as you say, um, it's not going to go away. Uh, eth including ethno-nationalism is not going to go away. And I'm wondering about, um, are there, uh, can we perhaps begin to think about other examples of nationalisms uh, which take a less aggressive form, uh, perhaps because they come out of so-called longer, longer entangled histories. Like, I mean, Scotland's going nationalist, right? But I mean, it's not, I don't think the, the nationalism they're proposing there is quite, you know, immediately thinking about taking up arms uh, physically, physical arms. Obviously, it's tied to much longer, deeper entangled histories uh, with the colonization from London going over 800 years or whatever. <clears throat> but I think, uh, so I'm just wondering about that. The other peripheries, so-called Scotland, even Ulster, something's going to happen in Northern Ireland uh, and Ireland, which is not necessarily going to take a, a violent form in the so-called unification. of. So I've just, uh, all I want to say is I think it's uh, very important that we world or extend the framework, the planetary framework of these, these discussions uh, to uh, 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 register and respect the specificities, but at the same time uh, insist that they throw critical light back upon a much wider picture to avoid being put into another ghetto or another form of balkanization. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much anyway. I think that if uh, we want to contribute to to the formation of a comprehensive political discourse in Europe, which will include these issues, not as a, uh, exceptionalist uh, narratives of the Balkans and so on and so on. So on. I think we need to to see what happened in Catalonia. What you know, that is the way to see that. So I, I had a friend. I have a very close friend who is a Danish uh, diplomat. At the time, he was saying to me, "But you are completely crazy," and I was saying to him, "We are all crazy in a way." So that is uh, what we need a little bit to to create, to, to, because otherwise it's very easy to stigmatize the Greeks and the Macedonians and Serbians. It's okay, the easiest thing to do. I mean, as we say, you, you open a church in Greece when it's something very easy to do. <laughs> Thank you. Are there some more comments, questions? Maybe we should pass the floor to Lavros. No, no, no. <laughs> Discuss this issue enough. There is, uh, I, can, I think Ian, Ian mentioned something very important, which is the current experiment with the nation building in Scotland. Of course. So, uh, according to the philosophy of new Scottish nation, Ian and myself, we are both Scottish. Yeah? So I live there, I have my address there, and, and he's Scottish by descent, and I'm a new Scot, and this is all great. Yeah? So this is how Scots managed to sell to the world a good nationalism, <laughs> like many other inventions. And this, of course, is a, is a very a clear strategy that uh, you have to offer a different uh, project, especially vis a vis the English national project and other, uh, other projects, which is based on territory, on civicness, and inclusiveness, and the, 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 the 
the thing that is clear to everyone, Scotland needs people. Yeah. And uh, uh, well, so you can be Pakistani, you, you, exactly. and you can do this and that. Of course, you'll get these kind of ethnic elements that are, you know, with, with all the you know, kilts and stuff like that. And you'll get Gaelic schools, and you get all these things put in the in the mix. But if you want to win the independence thing and then build a state, uh, you will need this idea that ever, everyone belongs who wants to live here. And this being, this is a very smart way of kind of uh, 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 putting the agenda and obviously getting a lot of support. And it might it might work. And of course, uh, the future is nothing else. Uh, in other cases, we see like a Catalonia, Catalonia that. Clearly, it's a question of language, it's a question of history, it's a traumatism of, of Franco years, of uh, repression over, over, over the, uh, the Catalans, uh, but it's you're entangled, you are in conflict with a different national idea that still persists, that Spain is one indivisible nation. So this is, it's a, Catalonia is non-issue, because Spain is indivisible, one nation, Catalans may speak now their language, but there is no discussion about, uh, about uh, um, um, only the left speaks about plurinationality, which is Podemos, yeah? Uh, speaks about plurinacionalidad as a way forward uh, uh, in Spain. But you see these philosophies are capable of creating serious, absolutely serious, serious conflict. So in this respect, no, it's not that, that we should pathologize Greeks or, 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 or anyone else, I'm just, Extremely worried that that in spite of postmodernism, in spite of uh, all these theories of sort of uh, picking and choosing your individual identities, that we are now more than ever in the context of the crisis of European Union as well as a supranational project, and having in mind the failure of Yugoslav supranational project, that we are again faced with a strong power of of, of nationalism uh, that will uh, that will uh, continue to. You inspired me now, both you and Ian, uh, maybe to think of um, these expectations or uh, uh, coming from outside the Balkans, that the Balkans is uh, condemned to certain form of behavior and that this kind of agreement uh, coming from the Balkans in the context of Europe, where there are many burning issues of similar kind that, uh, that seem to be irresolvable, all of the sudden, Greece and Macedonia managed to solve the problem, and that and that situation came from the Balkans, which is st stigmatized, as as Ian said. So maybe uh, the, the 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 last question, if if someone uh, may, maybe Gordon will have it. So this is not the last one, but maybe an additional maybe an additional question is: Do do you feel like the the agreement itself? Uh, got disproportionately little attention um, from from uh, the so-called international community and from the from the outside. Uh, whether this this agreement is is much more important not only for Greece and Macedonia, but as a paradigm that that issues such as this one and disputes can be resolved. Do you feel that 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 the, that the that the more significant reactions um, or, uh, uh, and, and attention was uh, uh, was actually uh, lacking from the European side. No, I think that uh, the, the agreement uh, has been recognized as a cornerstone for peace and security in this part of the world. And as you very well said, I believe that uh, if we were a little bit smarter, we would have cultivated a political strategy and communication which could have worked in this direction of deconstructing stereotypes about the Balkans and so on and so on. But the problem is that the Greek government now is not doing that because they cannot uh, be since they cannot implement the agreement in, in a sincere way as they should have been doing. Uh, and uh, I believe that also uh, Gordon is right by saying that uh, in this agreement we have to be honest, the Macedonian side gave more than what the Greek side gave. And this we have to say it. We cannot pretend that that has been an equal uh, division. Okay, for Greeks, uh, they will tell you we accepted the existence of a Macedonian nation. Okay, what can I do with you? You accepted the Macedonian nation. 
but uh, the others gave you their name. So in, in, in a way, this should be considered. So if we really need to construct a, a consolidated post-PRESPA perspective, what do we need to work? It's not that much what will happen in Greece and what will the internationals do, but how the agreement will survive in a toxic political environment in Macedonia, which of course we wants to eat, wants to, to get rid of the idea of the agreement. And I think that that is a pity. And in order to do that, we need to think not in a shallow idealistic liberal way of, okay, blah, 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 the, the way we have been seeing in the modern European politics today, but we need to go back to history. We need to teach the Macedonians how the Greeks perceived the existence of the Macedonian nation, why the Macedonian nation has been a problem for Greece, and we need to be sincere on that, and therefore, you are able to make a step forward. But by saying that all this is rubbish, all this is Balkan stupidity, etc., etc., then obviously you do nothing. And the more you do, this functions as a self-fulfilling prophecy in order to consolidate the underdevelopment and the underdog culture in your country and in my country also. We should, Thank not, you. We should not worry too much about that because now we have Bulgarians. Uh, <laughs> we are dealing with Bulgarians and we'll deal for many more years on uh, that. But I have a question for one your main table, sorry. What if this uh, minority, slava speaking minority, uh, the others, the others minority in that part of Greece during the civil war, what if they had taken the the right side? Absolutely. The right in the ideological they did. They did. <laughs> How can we how can we reimagine the situation in that kind of scenario? Pardon? How can we imagine from this perspective the, the development of the Macedonian question in Greece in, in, in the reverse scenario during 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 the civil war? Uh, if you uh, oh, as every community if you are talking about Slav-speaking community of northern Greece, it was not, uh, they were not thinking and acting in the same way. Mm -hmm. And in many areas of eastern Macedonia, of course, they supported the Bulgarians during World War II. Mm -hmm. The same goes for a certain percentage of western Macedonia that in, let's say, I put it in a, a some provocateur way, in 10 days, they turned from Bulgarians to Macedonians. But it's not something peculiar or something special in, in their case. Of course, they, or they didn't um, uh, became Macedonians in one day. They thought in certain, but we know the, what happened village by village, how they were supporting, even in Lerin, which they have a kind of Macedonian, uh, let's say, identity, okay? They changed from Bulga pro-Bulgarian to pro-Macedonian, pro-left. The same goes to Armenian, Armenians of Greece, for example, okay? They changed in one night in some cases. So, but what is very, very specific in the Macedonian question is that why Greece became the first independent nation in the Balkans? Because it has a great support from the Europeans. Why? Because the Europeans, let's say, decided, oh, I simplify, that this dark-skinned, uneducated savages have the right to an independent state because they are the descendants of ancient Greeks and they speak their language. Of course, the perception of Greek nationalism is purely religious. I mean, one fourth, one out of four Greeks in the, in the newly born Greek state in 8030 was Albanian speaking. One out of four. But they are Orthodox, so they were Greeks. The same goes to Bulgarian speakers. And at the point you have an independent Bulgarian church. And you take a, a region where, if you see it on the map, you have vast areas that no Greek was spoken. And this was a point. This was the anxiety and the the phobia of the Greek state, and still is. Still is a great phobia because they did not deserve this territory. 
And then goes the left, the Communist Party, that says, this territory, maybe it's not our territory. We will put the question of self-determination to West Macedonia. So it's the only time that one part of the Greek territory is under the question during the Greek Civil War. It's under question. So you see how this phobia of the Greek elites and uh, apparatus is created. So you have, anyway, to do some other things to, to prove the, that the antiquity of, Greek, of Macedonia is Greek, blah, 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 etc. So concerning the, all these Slav-speaking, let's say, areas, uh, you cannot say that even today have a lack of a common uh, sense or common identity. Of course, you have some changes, radical changes. For example, even in villages of Eastern Macedonia, now you have people that say, we are Greek, of course, but we are closer to Macedonians than the Bulgarians, which is something new, okay? But, okay, I think it's not uh, interesting, it's very... <laughs> I will not go on, okay, but just, I just want to finish with something that might help you understand what is the Macedonian question in Greece. In 1991 or two, it was a big uh, a demonstration, uh, let's protest. say, protest, one million people in Athens, okay? And I was shocked because at the same time, I was, at that time I was a lawyer and I was a lawyer of Macedonian activists. So I, I go to my house in Athens and I see a Greek flag because that was the... Uh, all the Greeks had to put a Greek flag at that day. And that did it my mother. My mother votes for the Communist Party. We never raised a flag even during the Greek di dictatorship, which was obligatory. But in 1992 she decided that she has to raise a flag because of the Macedonian issue. So you, you cannot imagine how this penetrated <laughs> the peop mind of the people, okay? <laughs> Thank you, Vavros. Um, I might say, we... Werdon, what uh, you said, there is the, 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 the story of antiquity, which is so, which became so trivial in, in Macedonia over the last years with Vemero. We need to say, for example, that uh, when there was uh, the war about the Macedonian territories, which is the first and the second Balkan war, the antiquity was not in the mind. Nobody bothered about Alexander the Great at the time. So at the time when territory was really at stake, antiquity was in non-existent. So that is, I'm trying to find arguments. Uh, okay. Um. Are there any other questions or comments? If not, we can we can finish this discussion. Thank you, Dimitris, and also thanks to all the others who participated in this discussion. Thank you very much.